Power Tools. Hello and welcome to the sixth webinar on the Power Tools series. I'm Kim Kinney Banerjee, the Coalition's Relations Manager at USBC, and I'm so glad to have you join us for this session. This Power Tools series is organized as part of USBC's training, technical assistance, and capacity building support for the network of state, territorial, tribal, and community breastfeeding coalitions across the United States. Access to these webinars is free and open to all interested breastfeeding coalition leaders, members, breastfeeding advocates, and to anyone involved in forming or leading nonprofit organizations in the breastfeeding field. The webinar announcement emails are sent through the USBC's coalition announcement list. And if you're not already on our list, you can go to our website, www.usbreastfeeding.org slash sign up and you'll be able to join our mailing list. These, this series is um, held on the odd numbered months and as you know the regular 2 to 2 series is held on the e even numbered months so we bring you a webinar every month. The webinar registration slides, handouts and recordings from the past sessions are all on, on the Power Tools page on our website. Again, you can go to our home page, go to the Quick Link section, and click on the Power Tools, and you can access all the handouts and the materials from this and previous webinars. <clears throat> During today's session, all participants are in listen-only mode. We'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for question and answers at the end of the presentation. Um, I invite you to type your questions in at um, any time during the presentation, and I'll pass them on to our presenters uh, during the Q&A portion. So here's how you do it. On the right of your screen, you should have to see your control panel. If you don't see it, it might be minimized. Click on the orange tab, and it'll pop back out. And scroll down below the audio section, and it will click on the questions tab, and it'll open up a box for you to type in. During the session, if you have any technical issues, please send an email to office at usbreastfeeding.org, and someone should be able to help you. And that brings me to today's topic. Let's talk breastfeeding. Much of the media coverage and public discourse about breastfeeding has focused on behavior change of the individual mother rather than on the context in which women and babies breastfeed and the systemic changes needed to support breastfeeding, to give all mothers and babies the strongest chance at, at breastfeeding success, we need to change our culture and build support in communities, hospitals, and workplaces. How do we talk about breastfeeding in ways that help shift the conversation and our culture? In this session, we'll discuss the concept of framing and share high-level findings from the research that the W.K. Kellogg Foundation commissioned as well as the new first food message guide. As you know, as you know, the Kellogg Foundation um, is among the largest philanthropic foundations in the United States. It's changing the paradigm and helping shape cultural norms around breastfeeding through its first food movement. With deep and sustained investment, the foundation has built partnerships with national, state, and local organizations across the United States to address racial inequities and improve the systems and ensure more babies benefit from breast milk as their first food experience. USBC is very grateful to the foundation for its support of our work as a field builder in the first food movement. I'm delighted to introduce you to a terrific panel to tell us more about the research and how to shift the conversation from mothers to the community. Our first presenter is Patrick Simpson. Patrick is a program officer and a member of the food, health, and well-being team at the foundation. Patrick serves as a convener, collaborator, and catalyst responsible for nurturing opportunities, for effecting positive systemic change in communities and executing programming efforts aligned with the foundation's mission. He focuses on funding opportunities that enable the foundation to make progress in ensuring that all children can be born healthy, 
grow and thrive by having love, good parenting, and access to health care. We are glad to have Omar Hussein, who is a communications manager at the foundation. In his role, he contributes towards increasing awareness and support for the foundation's vision through a comprehensive strategic communications program. He is responsible for implementing a wide range of communications tools that help deliver priority messages to the foundation's internal and external audiences. A final speaker is Kara Palmer, um, a friend to USBC. Many of us have heard you speak, Kara, at our past webinars and at our national conference. Kara is a senior accountant manager at Pyramid Communications, where she enjoys developing high impact communication strategies, crafting compelling messages, and mobilizing people to foster positive social change. She has more than 20 years' experience working with advocacy. Uh, working with nonprofits, businesses, and government agencies in communication, advocacy, and public affairs. Kara partners with the Kellogg Foundation to promote the priorities of the food, health, and well being program, including maternal and child health and first food, as well as the New Mexico programs. Kara previously worked as an advocacy officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where she employed various strategies to elevate key global health development and learning issues. We are so delighted to have you all with us to present today. And with that, I'm going to pass it over to Patrick. Take it away, Patrick. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, Kinkini. Um, we are delighted to be here today with all of you. Uh, the United States Breastfeeding Coalition and all of its members are doing an amazing and important work to support breastfeeding across the country. And we at the Kellogg Foundation are happy to be partners with you in the work. Uh, before going too much further, I did want to acknowledge my colleague at the foundation, Diana DeRehe, who is the program officer leading what we call our first food program. Some of you may know Diana, um, who really wanted to be with us today, but she is on maternity leave with her first child. And she assured me that uh, her daughter is a good breastfeeder. Um, Diana and I work closely together in the maternal and child health space, and she's been a real champion for the first food work. Um, we want to take a minute to first share a video highlighting how we're thinking about breastfeeding and how every one of us can play a role in supporting breastfeeding. It looks like the sound's not working, Kinkini, and we should move on to the next okay. slide. Yeah, it looks like it's technical difficulty. Um, so in our session today, we're going to spend our time to help you talk about breastfeeding with the purpose to engage and increase supportive environments for breastfeeding moms so more children have a healthy start that breastfeeding offers. So here's what we're going to cover this afternoon. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the W.K. Kellogg Foundation and why the foundation cares about breastfeeding. We're going to share our national opinion research about people's attitudes on breastfeeding. And we're going to go through sample messages and tips about talking about breastfeeding based on what we know from this research as well as tips for telling your story. And it's our hope that you walk away from our session today feeling inspired and empowered to help create culture change that supports breastfeeding. So to get us started, I'd like you all to take a moment, close your eyes, and take a few deep breaths. And imagine a child in your life, 
it could be your child, it could be your niece, your nephew, your grandchild, or one of your siblings. Now, as you imagine this child, what is your hope for them? How do you think about their future? You want the very best for that child, right? And we all have different thoughts of what that might mean to have the very best for all, our child. Okay, open your eyes now. What we want is for everyone to begin wanting the best for everyone's children. So we want to think about not only our children, our neighbor's children, and our friends and family's children, and as a country, we should want the best for all of our nation's children. The children we may not see who are living in poverty, who are living in under-resourced communities, in attending poorly resourced schools with parents who lack good paying jobs or affordable options for quality early child care. Those are the children most vulnerable and facing the most barriers to success in life. At the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, children are the center of the work that we do. Our founder, W.K. Kellogg, who created the breakfast cereal company you are all probably familiar with, he saw this back in 1930. His vision was to use his wealth to establish the W.K. Kellogg Foundation with a simple message to our trustees to use the money as you please as long as it promotes the health, happiness, and well-being of children. Mr. Kellogg's intent to serve all children continues to guide our work today through our mission to improve the lives of vulnerable children and families. At the Kellogg Foundation, we envision a future where every child has the opportunity to thrive. All too often, barriers like poverty and racism keep kids from reaching success and their full potential. So children are at the center of all we do. So you can see we have a circle graph illustrating the foundation's approach with optimal, ch optimal child development at the center. Our focus on investments, grant making, and programming for change is around the center. We concentrate resources from pre-birth to age eight with a focus on the most vulnerable children. Evidence supports early investment during this period. Research tells us a child's brain is 90% developed by age five, so education cannot begin at kindergarten. We also know a child's health is significantly shaped by her parents' health and what happens in the womb and by the nutrition and care the child receives during his or her early formative years. Not only do we seek improved outcomes in the health and education of kids, we also support parents so they have access to good jobs and training and ways to move up their career path. And we believe that people and communities have the capacity to solve their own problems and that the most effective solutions come from people directly impacted, involved in solution making. So in our work on healthy kids, we have four focus areas. Maternal and child health, which is the area I, I lead, supporting healthy birth outcomes and eliminating disparities in infant mortality rates. We focus on oral health, increasing access to affordable quality dental care for greater oral health. Food and community, improving access to healthy food for children, in school environments and in low-income communities where families are struggling to get ahead, and finally in the area of first food, where we focus on our breastfeeding work, 
creating supportive conditions so more babies and moms benefit from breastfeeding. Within our first food strategy, our goal is to improve children's health by ensuring all babies have the opportunity to benefit from breastfeeding as their first food experience. And we support this from a systems approach to understand where there are barriers, where there are more supports needed, and how to assure an equitable opportunities for all mothers to breastfeed their babies. Now, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Omar, who's going to talk about our first food communication efforts to help accelerate a cultural shift of breastfeeding. Omar. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, so as Patrick was saying, within our first food work, the Kellogg Foundation seeks to accelerate a uh, cultural shift in breastfeeding. Um, and so if you could imagine for a moment breastfeeding as a system, and to help with your imagining, we actually have this visual that shows the system as we see it. Uh, and what you see there is with the mother and child at the center, the bubbles around the mom and baby either can be supports or they can be barriers. Uh, the media, for example, can talk about how the breast may not be best or they can talk about, how, about the systemic changes needed to accelerate the cultural shift in breastfeeding. There are community supports or maybe lack thereof. There's the workplace and either supportive or unsupportive employers. There are healthcare providers who either promote or don't encourage breastfeeding. Uh, so what you see is here is that all these things can either be barriers or encouraging factors within the mother and child's lives. Um, and of course, on the internal circle, with uh, the woman's families, partners, and friends are all highly influential. And so what we're trying to do, when, especially when we began this work, uh, is taking a look at public conversation around breastfeeding. And what we found was it was so focused on the mother and individual, uh, especially in the media. And so if we go to the next slide, uh, what you'll see is uh, an array of articles um, we see headlines such as the milk wars, the case against breastfeeding, when breast isn't best, and so on. And so I think the thing you notice almost immediately when looking at these headlines is that they're narrowly focused on the mom and a woman's individual choice. You know, and so what we begin to see as outcomes is women have come to feel guilty and even demonized if they don't breastfeed. And what this does is this minimizes attention on the context in which women decide uh, and or are able to breastfeed for example, their hospital experience, the workplace situation, and other factors. And so with our communications efforts, we felt it was critical that uh, our goal, for our goal to be to change this culture from one that blames moms for not breastfeeding and one that supports moms and babies and families. And so on, what you see with this array of articles, is we're starting to see media stories that focus on the environment and the broader context in which women breastfeed. Um, so you see headlines, hospitals, ditch formula samples, promote, promote breastfeeding, California passes groundbreaking public health law supporting breastfeeding, and so on. So moving on to our, our research, I, I think what, we, what our point is, is there's an opportunity to tell a bigger story about breastfeeding that isn't focused on the woman, but rather on the environments and systems change needed to support women and their families who want to breastfeed. The systems change focus is what prompted us at the Kellogg Foundation to commission research to better understand people's perceptions and attitudes about breastfeeding and explore ways we could potentially reframe the conversation to focus on the bigger picture, the breastfeeding system, the supports needed in communities and hospitals and in workplaces. So next we're going to talk about the concept of framing because it really is crucial uh, not only to this research but so changing the narrative around breastfeeding as a whole. And that's what really prompted the Kellogg Foundation to uh, conduct this research to inform how we talk about breastfeeding. So what is framing? Uh, it's, it's a rather ambiguous term, but for, for us, you know, these specific words, images, and ideas, we, we use to focus people's attention is what we consider framing. In today's high-paced, information-rich technology-based society, People want to process information quickly and be on, getting on with their day. So we rely on cues to signal how we connect uh, to new information and what's already in our heads. Consciously and subconsciously, we use frames. We all do it to categorize information, to identify patterns, basically just 
to make sense of the world. Frames can uh, trigger emotions within us, values and associations we already have in our heads. So in communications, what we're trying to do is we're trying to resonate with people's deeply held values and worldviews. Uh, when communication is inadequate or ineffective, people just default to old frames or older pictures in their heads. However, when communication is effective, when we put the right frame on it, people can see an issue from a, a new perspective. It, it activates new modes of thinking or feeling. And really, hopefully, it'll lead to new actions. Uh, so before we get to some key framing principles, it's, it's important just to dive, take a quick look at the history of framing. Um, and so the, the notion of framing really has been around for a while. In the 1920s, Walter Whitman, uh, in his, his seminal piece of work, Public Opinion, talked about the connection between mass communications and public attitudes and policy. And so what you see there is, is a quote from it, the, the way in which the world is imagined determines at any particular moment what people will do. Uh, essentially, he was talking about framing. Many others have gone on to research framing and use it in messaging, uh, and it's evolved over time. We see organizations like the Berkeley Media Studies Group uh, out at UC Berkeley, who has worked specifically with California WIC Association on framing breastfeeding, and it, the impact of which has been tremendous. And so, w with that, I think it's important to, to take a look at some considerations for framing. Um, and so what, what are, are these key considerations? So we, we want to ensure that we're invoking common values. What are the values that enable people to find common ground, whether young, old, me, male, female, et cetera? Uh, additionally, we want to ensure that we focus on the environmental and systemic changes. This is really about the bigger picture versus the individual. And uh, I just want to make one last point about framing. Um, so on the, on the next slide, what we uh, begin to see is frames change the way we talk. They accommodate debate, but they also set new terms. That's from uh, a, part, a couple of partners from the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, Manuel Pastor and Rondo Ortiz, uh, who have written about building social movements and their specific sections within their research on framing has helped various social movements in, in the way they, they, they build momentum in their messaging. It's not, within breastfeeding though, it's, it's really just not about creating framing. It's creating framing so it's not about being a good or bad mother, it's about the health of our communities, about being a breastfeeding support culture so all babies and moms have the opportunity to breastfeed. And that's essentially where we, be, we, where we took our, our thinking right before uh, and into our research that Kara uh, right now is going to jump in and talk about and present some of our high-level research findings and messages we've been able to create. So, Kara? Thanks, Omar, and thanks everyone to, who has tuned, tuned in today. Um, I wanted to start by talking about what our research objectives were. Um, one, it was really to understand the perceptions and beliefs about breastfeeding, to assess what current breastfeeding and non-breastfeeding practices and reasons for each, and then to explore more deeply the barriers and opportunities to support breastfeeding, both in the workplace and in the healthcare and hospital situation, testing those messages that resonate with employers and with healthcare professionals. The foundation partnered with LJR Custom Strategies to conduct the research. Next slide. We um, started with six focus groups with new mothers, two with African American, two with Hispanic, and two with white or other ethnicity new moms. And for each, we had a group who breastfed and a group who did not. Then we conducted a national survey of 13,000 US residents age 18 and over, conducted by landline and cell phone. And then next, we wanted to explore the barriers and opportunities in the workplace and healthcare. So we did four focus groups and 10 in-depth interviews with employers and human resource executives, followed by three focus groups and 10 in-depth interviews with healthcare professionals. And the big takeaway, going back to what Omar just said about key framing principles, what was the first? It was invoking common values. So from the research, we distilled three shared values that we use to frame the messages and shape the messages for first food. The first shared value is opportunity. 
ensuring an equal chance for women to make real choices about breastfeeding, free from structural barriers and cultural barriers. We know from the research that people understand that breastfeeding isn't easy and that there are barriers. Still, people really believe every woman deserves the best chance for success. The second shared value that we distilled from the research is health a shared commitment to the health and well-being of every child, family, and community. It's really hard to argue against health. Health was a consistent theme in all the focus groups and the national poll. People believe in the health benefits of breastfeeding for babies and mothers and are motivated to support breastfeeding because of the health benefits it provides. And the third shared value is support. Support, encouraging and helping all women and babies successfully breastfeed. From the national poll and from the focus groups, people believe it's up to all of us to support breastfeeding and make it easier for moms and babies to breastfeed. Here's another way to think about these shared values and how to frame the conversation. Starting with the big idea, opportunity. The opportunity for all babies and mothers to breastfeed. Building on that is what's the issue? What's at stake? Why is this important? It's really about the health of all mothers and babies and the health of families and communities. And lastly, what's the specific issue? What's needed for everyone to be successful? It's support. To give all mothers and babies the strongest chance at breastfeeding success, we need to build support in communities, in healthcare, and in workplaces. So this next slide shows the cover of the, of the um, message guide. It's actually supposed to show the message guide, but it's a different slide. I'll just talk about it. Um, this, this message guide was created to be a resource for grantees and partners, along with everyone who wants to change the conversation and culture around breastfeeding. Um, after this, I think it'll be available on the USBC website, the Power Tools um, website that Kim Keeney referenced at the beginning. And this and guide includes four sections, one about first food generally, and three about the key audiences and areas of support, families and communities, healthcare professionals, and hospitals employers. Next, I'd like to walk through the high-level findings from the research in each of these areas and how the findings have helped shape the research and the messaging. So this first slide, the importance of first food, starting with first food and breastfeeding generally, some really good news and a key takeaway for communications from the research was that people have an extremely positive attitude towards breastfeeding. From the national survey, 82% of all respondents have a positive reaction to breastfeeding. Women of color were most favorable with 89% reacting positively and white women slightly less positive at 79%. Even moms who did not breastfeed have a very positive reaction to breastfeeding with 75% of white non-breastfeeding moms and 84% of non-breastfeeding moms of color being supportive of breastfeeding. Additionally, both the national poll and the focus group show that people understand the importance of breastfeeding and its enduring benefits for both babies and moms. So we're starting with a really solid base here and positively about breastfeeding. It's not about, it's an opportunity to cha change the frame from breast against formula to one that is about the systems of support. And the slide now that the 61% strongly agree, it's up to all of us, shows that there's more good news, that people really support the idea of making it easier for moms to breastfeeding and that everyone has a role to play. When you, we had really high numbers in terms of the strongly agree, so we use, we're using those numbers, but when you add in the partly agree, it goes up to 85%. So talking more about the roles, the role of families and communities. We know that families and communities play a critical role in supporting breastfeeding, and the research affirmed this. We surveyed people about public spaces to nurse in communities, and 71% said it would be very helpful to have clean private spaces in malls, restaurants, and other public places where women can breastfeed. 89%, it goes up to 89% if you include the part they agree. Um, can you move forward to the next slide, please? And then the one after that. We also asked about increasing breastfeeding knowledge. 65% say it would be very helpful to have education about breastfeeding so everyone is more knowledgeable about the benefits and more accepting of it. It goes up to 87% when you include the partly agree. 
Additionally, we explore the role of families and communities in breastfeeding success. Not surprisingly, promoting breastfeeding works. In communities where breastfeeding is promoted, rates go up. Also from the focus groups, encouragement from family members played a huge role for women who succeeded with breastfeeding. The message guide includes additional context and messages about the role of families and communities, which you can read after the webinar. We also surveyed people nationally and talked with doctors and nurses in focus groups about the role of healthcare in supporting breastfeeding. We all know medical professionals and hospitals have a unique influence on new parents and therefore play a vital role to get moms off to a strong start with breastfeeding. And we found nationally there's strong agreement. 68% strongly agree that hospitals should be baby friendly and support breastfeeding. This is strongly agree. The focus groups underscored the importance of education and awareness about the concept of breastfeeding. It was interesting to talk with healthcare professionals not familiar with baby friendly and the concept behind it. They thought it was a PR gimmick, um, whereas those working in baby friendly designated hospitals or those in the process of becoming baby friendly were more promotional of breastfeeding as well as supportive. Though by the end of the focus groups, all were on board. Now we just need to have all medical professionals not familiar with baby friendly take part in focus groups. Additionally, we found parents who successfully breastfed are more likely to have support from their doctors and a lactation consultant or peer counselor. The day and time of when women gave birth tended to influence their breastfeeding success because of the very variations in support from lactation consultants or peer counselors on the weekends or if they're giving birth off hours. Doctors share that they tend to receive little or no training on breastfeeding, often drawing on their own personal experiences. They also talked about the perceived lack of support from family members and returning to work shortly after giving birth as the major barriers and obstacles to breastfeeding. They recognize their, they have a critical role to play and realize the importance of their talking with expectant moms about the health benefits, benefits as well as planning ahead for dealing with difficult family members or returning to work. The messaging that resonated with, with doctors and health professionals is that every mom, every breastfeeding mom deserves the best chance for success. Healthcare providers can help by sharing the benefits of breastfeeding with expectant moms, supporting new mothers as they learn to breastfeed, and encouraging them to continue nursing through their baby's first months, six months. This goes back to what Omar said about the key print key framing principles, and one of them is showing solutions and showing the role that you can play. So I think that's partly how this messaging resonated with doctors and healthcare professionals. We also looked at the role of employers and workplaces. These days, a majority of women who have newborn babies are working outside of the home and must return to work shortly after giving birth. In the focus groups with new moms, we heard this is such a barrier that some women don't even start breastfeeding because they know they'll have to go to back go back to work quickly. Nationally, people agree that we need to support moms in the workplace. 66% say it would be very helpful for workplaces to support breastfeeding mothers by giving them time and space to pump and a place to store breast milk. Goes up to 85% if you include the partly agrees. The good news and key takeaway on the workplace front is that most employers recognize the importance of breastfeeding and want to be supportive. They just need the guidance and support. There's tremendous opportunity for education engagement around employers and workplaces. Most employers are matter of fact about accommodating breastfeeding moms. Employers can be hesitant though to enact official workplace policies and prefer to accommodate breastfeeding mothers on a case by case basis. One of the biggest barriers is really lack of communication, which is kind of a thread from the healthcare to the workplace. Um, that employers and employees are not necessarily talking in advance about how to accommodate breastfeeding needs. Though from the, a key takeaway is that the most of the focus group participants realize that they could do more on the front end with moms. Messaging that resonates is helping breastfeeding moms succeed can be as simple as providing break time and a space to pump breast milk at work. Again, helping them see themselves as part of the solution and being supportive was key. So here are some key messages. The first being, let's make breastfeeding possible together. Tying back to the beginning and what we said about framing, 
Key messages ought to be framed in a way to help change the conversation, to be clear, concise, and compelling. Breastfeeding benefits not just moms and babies, but also whole communities. This brings in the why, and it broadens the fame beyond the immediate beneficiaries to every one of us. It also emphasizes interdependence, which is what another one of those four principles of framing. Every one of us can play a role in supporting breastfeeding success. Again, shifting the responsibility from the individual mother to society. It's not just up to moms. Everyone can make breastfeeding easier. This aligns with the Surgeon General's call to action to support breastfeeding and with how CDC and others are now talking about breastfeeding. And the focus needs to be on the environments and the context in which women breastfeed. To give all mothers and babies the strongest chance at breastfeeding success, we need to build support in communities, hospitals, and workplaces. And lastly, having your target audience see themselves as part of the solution and how they can help support, which was that fourth principle of framing, showing solutions. We need to be specific about what people can do. This is the messaging I referenced earlier. Helping breastfeeding moms succeed can be as simple for employers as providing break time and a private space to pump breast milk. This simple statement provides a way for employers to imagine what it might take and based on our focus group research, we might also add talk to expectant employees about their potential breastfeeding needs at work. So now we want to share a few tips about telling your story and messaging. Any social change effort requires effective communications. So we just have four short tips. One is start with the end in mind. All good communication efforts are rooted in your end goal, thinking about where you want to go and starting with that. Without a clear goal, your efforts can sometimes be communication for the sake of communication. As author and comedian Ben Stein puts it, the indispensable first step to getting the things you want out of life is this, decide, with, decide what you want. This sounds easy enough, but still often we skip this step and go right to the how before deciding what we're aiming for. Our second tip is about knowing your audience. Who do you need to reach and who is affected by your work? The best idea and the best communications in the world mean nothing when it doesn't reach or engage the audience that you need to. Um, think about who you need to educate, inspire, motivate, move, pers persuade, and what do you know about them? This will help you figure out what they need to hear. As Fanny Bryce says, your audience gives you everything you need. There is no director who can direct you like an audience. Our third tip is really to use clear messages. Messages make up the story you want to tell. They are the key points you want to make with the audiences you need to reach. So here are a few questions to ask yourself when creating messages. First, starting with what are the one to three most important points you want your audience to understand? It's also helpful to think about what is the action that you want your audience to take? And then lastly, is what you're saying clear, concise, and compelling? We use these, we call these the three C's and use them as benchmarks as we're creating messages to think about, okay, is this clear? Is this short enough? Are there extra words that I should take out? Is this really compelling? Our last tip is about don't forget about the visuals. We've all heard the adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, in today's information-rich society, powerful visuals are really more important than ever. Next slide, please. Our brains process visual content 60,000 times faster than text. 60,000 times faster. And I know we focused a lot today on the messages, but don't forget about the visuals. That's part of your messaging. It's part of your communication to help tell your story. Here are a few examples. Um, this is from the Black Mothers Breastfeeding Association in Detroit. They're a Kellogg Foundation grantee. 
and they are committed to building networks of support for African American women and strengthening systems to overcome the historical, cultural, and societal barriers to breastfeeding success. I think this is a very compelling picture. The colors, the composition, the multi-generational aspect. It's also very welcoming, which aligns with their mission of wanting to create a supportive network. The next is from Hector Cruz. He started Project Breastfeeding, and it's really an image, he's a photographer and a dad, and it's an image campaign to normalize breastfeeding. When his wife gave birth, he really felt a little helpless and wanted to do something to help empower moms and dads, as well as to normalize breastfeeding. So this image is from If I Could, I Would campaign, and it shows a series of dads in the breastfeeding position and it's really to raise awareness about breastfeeding and to help normalize it. They also have a Facebook page with lots of great images. And this last example is from the Greater New Orleans Breastfeeding Awareness Coalition. Um, they're also a, a grantee of the Kellogg Foundation. They have launched several campaigns to help normalize breastfeeding in the New Orleans area. And this is from their Breastfeeding NOLA campaign, which uses the tagline, Eat Local, Anytime, Anywhere and they pair it with images of women and families breastfeeding around the city. Showing it, it's very normal. So now I'd like to turn it back to Kinkini and we'll take some questions and answers. I guess we'll take some questions and try and provide the answers. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Kara, Omar, and Patrick. And um, we do have questions. <coughs> So um, we had a question about uh, the different um, stakeholders that you spoke about in the earlier s slide that you have to deal with when you have the context, the formula companies, the media, and all of that. So if you could tell us a little bit more about um, the focus groups that you did and um, you know the ways in which um, some of the data that you said um, there's some interest in knowing the process in which how uh, how the study was done and how this was the the 2.0 is different from the earlier um, breastfeeding guide. Sure. So the first. Um guide we've, we've we find it since then so the research we undertook it was starting with moms to help us inform what the national survey would be in terms of the questions and then out of that and the first messages the first round of messages that we developed from that we got a lot of feedback of wanting to dig deeper into the healthcare professionals and what were the barriers and opportunities as well as the workplace and employers and so the idea was to do focus groups with each of those um, as well as these in-depth interviews. And as I was saying, you know, the good news, I mean, it seemed like it raised a couple of opportunities. Um, one, that there just wasn't the communication going on. And then two, there was this receptivity, though, of people saying, you know, if they knew what the solutions were, they could help and be a part of that. And so that is what informed the message guide. It informed sort of how we framed it, thinking that there was opportunity instead of coming at it from an angle where, you know, we're, we're having to convince employers it's, no, there's this receptivity there, and so let's figure out how to talk about it in a way that's um, supportive. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. There are quite a few questions about, you know, how using data and storytelling, and for a lot of our coalition partners, they are, um, folks from the public health field, from the healthcare setup, and just working to be able to tell stories is, uh, is a newer challenge to them to be using graphics and data. And any tips uh, from you pros about using data or infographics would be helpful. Yeah, actually, sure, I can uh, answer that. Go ahead, Omar. Go ahead, Kara. Uh, well, I, I was just going to say, uh, when, when it comes to using data, there's, there's certainly the obvious um, trappings that come with just wanting to unload every piece of, of 
uh, numeric data or qual qualitative data you have uh, in whatever document that you're trying to disseminate. And you know, I always think about uh, what Dr. Gail Christopher has said numerous times, and, and Gail has been a tremendous uh, partner in the first food breastfeeding work for so long. And she she often talks about how the brain is naturally wired for for story for narrative. And so when working with with data or research and trying to tell a compelling uh, or trying to put together compelling messaging, it seems to almost always work better when you're able to wrap it around a narrative and tell a story. So you're not simply relying on a percentage or uh, longitudinal data, but rather you're you're putting the reader or the your end user at the center of your story. You're making them the hero of their story. Um, Carrie, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, that was great. I was going to say something similar in terms of there's a concept called social mass, and it's if you are wanting to use numbers and data to try and make it um, imaginable. So there's an example of like thinking about um, you know maybe there's toxic pollution in your neighborhood, and I I've heard of um, a group using that as an example, but then turning into like imagine like x many number of balloons are going to be dropped on you know. Children. I mean, that's actually <laughs> maybe too extreme of an example, but dropped, you know, dropped on the neighborhood if we don't take care of this toxic um, pollution um, problem. And so, really, um, using that narrative, as Omar said, it's like our brains are hardwired for storytelling, and if we're going to use data to try and make it um, relatable, and you know, it's four times, you know, that's the size of the, you know, the space, the you know, a football stadium, or trying to, you know, use those sort of metaphors that help you understand what the data is. Thank you. Perfect. And then um, we have one of our um, participants saying that um, framing breastfeeding as a biological norm requires identifying and stressing the deleterious nature um, and health hazards of formula. Uh, for example, instead of just saying breastfeeding makes babies smarter, um, a lot of our care providers are now um, even talking about that formula feeding might impede um, some of the risks of formula feeding. And in your focus groups, was there any, uh, did this play a role at all about um, in your framing? The risks of formula feeding versus the benefits of breastfeeding? Uh, from the focus groups and from the national poll, we found that people, um, you know, while it wasn't as favorable as breastfeeding, there was, still was support for formula and concluded that it really didn't, it wasn't going to be successful to make formula the bad guy, that it's really um, promoting the messages around breastfeeding. Because um, when then you start to get into the breastfeeding versus formula, it, it gets that old frame and that old debate pitting one against the other and then also um, making that focus about moms again. And so really trying to shift it out of there, not focus on the negative effects of um, formula or you know downplaying formula, but really just lifting up the positive and the supports needed for breastfeeding is what we took away from the research and, and talking with people. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, so similar to what Kara just said in terms of working with a positive frame rather than a negative frame, I, I, I certainly think that stating uh, the facts around uh, formula and whether it impedes uh, growth or not or, or, or cognitive development or not, it, it's certainly a compelling message, but one danger you run when, when exerting those messages out into the public is, is shaming uh, mothers who attempted to breastfeed uh, and couldn't for whatever reason. And so our, our, our national research did find that one of the uh, reasons that formula was ever even um, positively looked upon was as a backup if, if initiation wasn't achievable in, in a lot of mothers and a lot of families. And so at the risk of alienating the mom, it's probably just better to stick with the positive, right? Right, and that very important thing of then restricting the debate again to the to bringing it to the level of what, what a choice for the mother rather than the context in which um, 
breastfeeding is successful, all the other elements. So thank you for that. And again, lots of questions about, you know, we have all these, we work in the field, we have these great breastfeeding mother stories. And um, really, these tips have been very helpful in how to now create your talking points and make that uh, uh, story and using statistics selectively and making marrying the data with the story and making the numbers relatable. So um, lo lots of comments about using data and telling the stories and the these tips that you have. Wonderful. And I just wanted to tell our uh, listeners that we will have the PDF of the breastfeeding guide on our website. So with the recording, you will also find a guide. Just scrolling down through one. Yeah, much more about um, using using the guide, how uh, might we use the guide, how have you worked with, um, with some of the Kellogg work that's going on at the grassroots level, so either Patrick or Omar. Um, I know you're in the Michigan um, office, so folks want to hear a little bit more about what that, you know, the program, the, <coughs> um, the health, well-being, and food program does. Can, Kenny, I guess I'm not fully understanding the question. It, it, the, the so question some more that... work about what the first food um, work of the Kellogg Foundation is, and what some uh, what are some of the work at, in the ground that the food health and well-being team does? Any descriptions, um, folks are wanting to know. Sure, and keep in mind uh, we we have full descriptions of our of all of our program areas on wkkf.org. And you know, as Patrick was saying earlier in the presentation, our food health well-being. Uh, and keeping optimal child development at, at the center uh, looks at health, food, health, and well-being from four uh, perspectives. You know, one of which is our food and community program, which aims to provide fresh, healthy, and nutritious food uh, to communities and schools through a variety of, of lever points. Whether that's uh, you know the farm to school movement, it's uh, food hubs or value chains, working with local farmers markets. Um, obviously, our first food work, which aims to increase breastfeeding initiation rates nationwide um, and find community support levers. So uh, there's just a, a culture that's propelling breastfeeding as a, as a cultural norm, rather. And, and Kimberly, I would encourage everybody to look up Kimberly Seal Valors, and she's done some tremendous work around uh, framing and messaging, and she talks about first food deserts. And uh, food deserts is a term that came out of our food and community work. And so the term originally was talking about how in some communities, the only place you can get food is a, is a, corner, um, is a corner store mm -hmm. that would only have processed food and whatnot. So those were, those were deemed food deserts. And so what Kimberly has done is she's taken that uh, term and applied it to breastfeeding. So communities that don't necessarily have supportive workplaces, healthcare providers, those are first food deserts. And so how do we work to uh, change first food deserts to first food supportive communities? And so she's done a lot of work on that. I'd definitely look her up. Uh, additionally, uh, Patrick mentioned our, our oral health work, our dental therapy work, and that's uh, working with communities to ensure that the, there is um, not just a primary uh, dental providers available to children and families, but also alternative uh, providers, whether it's dental therapists, uh, which we've seen tremendous uh, impact and results in, in communities in Alaska and Minnesota. Um, and then our, our fourth uh, point within our food health well-being work is maternal and child health. And it, it feels a little silly for me to be describing it when Patrick's sitting next to me. Uh, but the the health and well-being of not just the child from uh, preconception all the way through conception and at the Kellogg Foundation we focus on a zero to eight frame, but also the health of a mother before conception and what goes into the societal um, 
barriers and conditions that affect the mother's health going into the conception of a child during the pregnancy and thereafter. Uh, so looking at it from a systemic perspective and how we can create far more uh, positive environments for mothers and children and families in general. Like I said, uh, on WKKF.org, though, we, uh, that information is all there for you, and we actually have some downloadable resources as well. Great. Um, thank you, Omar, because the, all, all of these uh, domains really cross-cut the work that our coalitions do. Most of them are doing, um, all, all of them are working on um, obesity prevention, chronic disease prevention, uh, child health, maternal child health, um, oral health, all of these are such important work. So knowing, going to your uh, website and looking at the resource guide as well. And um, real good takeaway point is know your audience because for our coalitions, they are talking to mothers, they're talking to healthcare providers, they're talking, advocating with legislators. So really knowing your audience and tailoring the message is a, um, is a key point uh, that we took away. Um, today. I am going to try and see if we can run the video, so I'm going to turn it over to Danae, who is going to try and see if we can run the video one time. That, that's an excellent video. You're on, Danae. Every child. Every mother. Every one of us. The New Mexico Breastfeeding Task Force is focused on creating baby-friendly communities. And what that means is we want to encourage families, we want to encourage the community, healthcare providers, employers, we want to encourage childcare providers to help moms be able to provide and continue to breastfeed their children as long as they want. Talking about it and supporting is two different things. So um, I am a certified breastfeeding counselor in, a, in my community. Everybody knows if you have anything to do with mamas, you come to me, but breastfeeding is my thing. Yeah, breastfeeding is my thing. Women need to be able to honor their bodies and do what they were put on this earth to do is to um, raise greatness. And I'm about raising greatness. Our mission is to make sure that all families are able to succeed. The mamas, the breastfeeding mamas are at the table saying what matters to them and what matters to their families. Women breastfed for thousands of years. That's how we got to where we are today. And then I guess it was in the 1930s that people decided they should be modern and they came along with formula and formula figured out they could make money and so they did. And then we started to do research and discover that, guess what? Breast milk is a lot better for you than formula. And so I feel it's one of my duties as a doctor to kind of undo the harm that we as a medical profession have done. We believe that breastfeeding um, basically rebuilt our our people, our tribe. Through mom's breast milk, it, it nurtures the baby, but it also gives the mom's life story, the mom's knowledge and culture through her breast milk. We are working at changing the societal norms, so that breastfeeding is normal, so that it's accepted, and so that it's anticipated, so that everyone feels they have the ability to reach their own goals. Every child. Every mother. Every one of us. Every one of us. Every one of us. Thank you. And on that inspiring note, I'd like to thank Patrick, Omar, and Kara for a terrific session. As you know, the recording will be available as well as um, the first food guide. Uh, thank you so much to our panelists today, and thanks to you for all you do to improve the lives of women, children, and families. Goodbye for now, and I look forward to having you all for our next webinar session. Thank you. Thank you.